We are creatures of desire. What we most desire is meaning. What makes us suffer most is a lack of meaning. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Marital therapist, author, and communications trainer Andrew G. Marshall invites guests from all walks of life to discuss what makes life meaningful. Hello, I'm Andrew G. Marshall, and welcome to The Meaningful Life. My witness today is Caroline Madden, PhD, a Los Angeles-based pro-marriage therapist who specializes in helping marriages recover after infidelity. She's the author of several books, including Fool Me Once, Should I Take Back My Cheating Husband, and After a Good Man Cheats, How to Rebuild Trust and Intimacy with Your Wife, and Blinded by His Betrayal. I've spent 35 years helping couples deal with the trauma of discovering your partner has been unfaithful, and I found that although these couples arrive at my office the most distressed, they can leave the happiest. I used to think it was because they were prepared to look deeper and work harder than most couples who know where the bodies are buried but choose not to go there. But I wonder now if picking their way through the rubble of their old marriage, some people end up questioning everything they took for granted, not just about their marriage, but ask themselves the most important question of all, what makes my life meaningful? So I've invited Caroline to be my witness today so we can pool our combined knowledge and find if there is any light in the dark topic of infidelity. Now, I love the title of your book, Why Are People So Blindsided by Betrayal? Because statistically, we all know it's actually quite common Right. But it's like a traffic accident. You know, we drive by here in California on the freeway. We see a traffic accident. Traffic accidents exist. But, you know, I'm a safe driver. I'm a defensive driver. I know my limitations. And so you just can fool yourself that it won't happen to you. And I make the analogy of an infidelity as being like that. You're just driving in your own lane. And all of a sudden the Mack truck hits you. And the Mack truck is your spouse who's hit you with something like this. So where it's something that people understand happen, they just think that they have chosen better. And for me, the couples that I treat are, I call it good men, right? And so it's their pillars of their community. They're active in church. They're the little league coach. They're the ones you could always count on at PTA to set up the folding chairs. So I think the idea is, well, a cheater is a cad and, you know, is different as one of these me too guys. It's not true. So it's surprising to them. Right. And is it almost, do you think that people have, and they haven't actually used these words, but a sort of a magic cloak of protection. And the magic cloak is you choose a good person, you are good yourself, and you have a good marriage. And if you sort of follow all the rules and you do the right things, of course, everything's going to be fine. And then suddenly we discover that there's actually no such thing as a magic cloak that protects us. Does this speak to you? Absolutely. Especially my adult clients who they knew that their parents cheated. Right. So they really think I'm going to pick well, right? And they'll they'll pick a partner who's maybe dad left the mother and, you know, the child was there to pick up the pieces and think, oh, well, you saw what that did to your mother. I'm really safe with you. You absolutely wouldn't do something like that to me. So it's like, even more so in picking up the partner. So what do you think actually is the long-term impact of somebody of actually when they were children seeing their parents cheat and actually knowing about it probably because the whole thing exploded across the family? Well, I have very few rules in my counseling office, my coaching office. And one of the few rules is do your best so the kids don't know about the infidelity ever. Even if they're adults, there's a thought, oh, well, they're adults. No, no, your dad is still your dad. Your mom is still your mom because it does have long-term impact. One way I notice it, and this is from my adult clients reflecting back at their childhood. Okay, One, their father, say was the father who cheated, was no longer there to be Superman, to provide moral guidance to provide more leadership to the family. There was, I need to protect my mom at all costs. I can't even like dad because there's a natural protective, let me protect my mom element. I think that we all have instinctually. It's also this idea of, oh, I understand that love can hurt before they really have the experience of love. 
you know, and how magical it is and amazing it is. And so they can get in this idea of either you're cheated on or you will be cheated. So almost the more that they get in love, the more they're like, oh no, something bad's going to happen to me. I'm going to be devastated. So let me have like one foot emotionally out of the relationship. Let me cheat myself. Let me put myself in a more powerful position, uh, they think, by cheating. And then it's very damaging. It's very, very damaging. And I think what's particularly damaging is all of this stuff that you're talking about is, in my experience, often going on under their unconscious brain. So the everyday brain that is, you know, making tea and collecting the kids Mm -hmm. isn't aware of this stuff. It's inside. And we sort of know the information is there, but because it happened so long ago, we say, well, actually, that's no longer relevant. But actually, it's still there. And I think this is something that men in particular find very difficult because they've been told to act. They haven't been told to look inside. So they're so busy acting, they've sealed off this inside. And so they're not necessarily always conscious of this old material and how it might be a ticking time bomb. Absolutely. I mean, we do not do a good job of helping boys and young men and therefore adult men access feelings or even have a language around it. I mean, how many times, Andrew, in your office have you had a wife say to her husband, you know, tell me how you feel, how you feel. And you look at him and you realize he has no idea how he feels. Yeah, he's only got about three words to describe his feelings, which are sort of okay, good, not so good. And life is more complicated than that. And I say that men in society are allowed to have three feelings. One is they're allowed to be happy, right? Happy, sure, everything's going good. I'm confident, I'm happy. The next one is angry, really allowed for a lot of anger. And the third one is drunk. (laughs) And from drunk, you can get the I love you man moments, the deeper conversations, the crying, the whatever. So it's not that men are withholding from their wives. They just don't even know. And it's so sad that men are allowed to be angry because they use it to shut off all the other complicated feelings that they're not actually having. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's okay to be angry, but it's okay to be all these other things too. And how do you think we can get that message across to men? Well, I'm raising two, hopefully future men myself right now. And uh, what what are you doing? Well, they're also growing up in a whole different environment with, you know, classmates having the future is female and so much excitement over a female vice president and whatnot. They're they're also raised in a different world. And, you know, mommy is a therapist and I think I try to do a good job of mirroring the clinical term of, you know, how are you feeling? Is this how you're feeling? But I can already see it in, in my oldest son. He's 12 and he he learned a couple of years ago, it was not okay to cry in front of his guy friends. So guy friends he's had since he's been two years old. They've cried, they've gotten their diapers changed in front of each other, but suddenly the boy code happened and it just happened right before my eyes that he knew that wasn't okay anymore. They suddenly get a memo, get delivered, and you've got a, suddenly got a different son. Yes. And even it's Valentine's Day coming up and it asked, you know, my son, oh, well, you know, what about Valentine's Day? You know, just as like platonic friendship, you know, hand out Valentine's Day to his entire class. He was like, oh God, no. And it wasn't a, I'm too cool. It was like, I'm not giving my guy friends Valentine's mom. Like that's... That is a bit weird, isn't it? Yeah, that's not going to happen. And meanwhile, you know, my nine-year-old is like, oh my goodness, this is so exciting. I'm so excited. I said, all my friends, little notes that I'm thinking about them. So I know, yeah, a boy code happens, you know, and I, I do think we have to look at society and how it's benefited society, men compartmentalizing their emotions, that they do so much better than women do. You know, where I always say that men are like, waffles, you know, it's like one square, one square, one squirrel, and women are spaghetti. We're all in it. We're always multitasking. Always multitasking. Men are waffles and women are spaghetti. Tell me I'm wrong. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not wrong. But, but so, when, so we talk about the, the topic of today, infidelity. How could he do that and then come home to me? How could he do that and then lay next to me in bed? How does that happen? It's because he compartmentalized. How do we have, have we always sent men to war and had them come back? You know, I honored that a certain percentage of my pro bono work is with military families and hearing the stories of men who, by the way, when they were at war, totally faithful, never had a problem with fidelity, absolutely faithful, 100,000%, but coming back and all that, trying to reintegrate with 
human beings. I often use the word trauma when it comes to discovering your partner has been unfaithful. Do you think that's too strong a word or do you feel trauma is an appropriate word for this? It's an absolute appropriate word and it's something that I wrote about extensively in my PhD thesis. And I use a trauma model. And so many therapists, I think, make the mistake of let's jump into, quote unquote, what was wrong with the marriage and don't do step one, which is someone's just gotten hit by a Mack truck and they need to feel stable. They need to feel safe, have all the trauma symptoms of checking behavior, you know, once very strong, competent, people who are crying on the bathroom floor in the fetal position because they just don't even know what happened. And then they're just supposed to go in the world and act like their whole life hasn't been destroyed. I mean, at least if they were in a car accident, they could say, oh, gee, I was in a car accident. I got mugged. We've just been hit by a truck. What should we do? Well, we've just been hit by a Mack truck. We were in our own lane, minding our own business, following the rules. And a Mack truck came from the other side of the road and creamed into us. And we're rolling. We're rolling in that car, but we know it's our spouse that pushed us over the edge. So what men are infamous for doing is what I call the drip, drip, drip of truth. Just a little bit. What does she find out? Let me give it a little more. And so every time she finds out, either through him telling her, which doesn't happen, or through her own discovery of a new detail, that car rolls again. So the car has to stop rolling. And what the car stopped rolling is, is when a woman gets the full, complete timeline with all the details that she wants. And this is where there is a gender difference. Often men do not want to know the details at all whatsoever. They don't even want to know who the guy is because they're afraid then they'll have to do something. If I know who he is, don't I have to go beat the crap out of him? Where a woman wants every different detail to establish her timeline. And it's at that point, the car stops rolling. And the one thing I would say is don't think you've got the timeline straight away because your husband will do this. He will give you information in bits and pieces. It's not because he's a cruel bastard. It's because that is the way he's going to do it. That's the way men do it. And I wish it was different, but it isn't, unfortunately. It isn't. And this is where I try to explain to couples here is your unique. You're, you're both unique human beings, you know, Helen and Bob or whatever. Helen and Bob, you're unique human beings. This is your unique dynamic. But I need to tell you, Helen, all men do the drip, drip, drip of truth. And one of my first individual sessions with the man, I'm always like, I know you don't understand it, but you need to believe me. By the time a woman is in my office, what's going to get a man divorced isn't the affair. It doesn't matter what he's done, really, because she's made a commitment she wants to stay. It's to continue being a shady McShader and the drip, drip, drip of truth. Well, two things, the drip, drip, drip of truth and just happening to phone the other woman to see how she's doing. She's crying. Often her husband is found out. And guess what? They're getting a divorce. Her life is crumbling. Trying to help him understand that his wife's feelings have to come first And no, your wife doesn't care. Your wife does not care about this woman's feelings. She does not care that she's having to face the consequences of her poor choices, which is her husband leaving. But yes, they they want to stay friends. Can we be friends? Let me just check in. And there's so many different ways to check in on people, all the different ways. Well, when I first started, the only two ways to do it was sending a letter through the post Oh, actually, there were three. Sending a letter through the post, phoning the phone that stood on the hall table, and waiting for them outside after work. Those were the three options. Well, there's now like three million different ways of doing it. How have you found that it's actually got harder to recover because of technology? Well, number one, that there's an electronic record. So many of them, text messages, emails, you can search emails for years. And so all of the conversations you can read, and of course you're reading them out of context, or you're reading them in context. I mean, reading your husband tell another woman, I love you, is bad. You know, (laughs) there's no no getting over that. So also that because there's such this electronic footprint, one, it's so much easier to get caught, honestly. But two, women as a response to the trauma for using the recovery from traumas is the base of this. There's so much to look at and look at again and again and again. And I think that they do that even though it harms them, it sets them back, it doesn't help them. I I think they think, if well, if I stare and I read every single text message for literally the thousandth time, maybe I will see the why, why, why he did this. 
you know, because that's what they can't understand is the why. And the great problem is neither will your husband, mm -hmm. because you need a lot of personal insight to understand why. It's the reason why I wrote a book called Why Did I Cheat? Mm -hmm. Because the people who cheat generally cheat because they've actually got no self-knowledge. Mm -hmm. They're not aware of all the material that's churning around inside them that is actually contributing towards that. Mm -hmm. And if you don't understand that, you won't be able to answer the question, why did I cheat? And this is the another one, I don't know if you get this a lot, is how could you have managed to cheat like this? You know, How could you look yourself in the mirror each day and keep going? So the how and the why are the two questions that I get asked the most. Are there big questions you keep on getting asked? Well, it's the why. And the why in the beginning is just a terrible question to ask, even though I know why it's being asked and I don't blame anyone for asking it. But he's going to start telling you the things wrong with you and the marriage. Those are his alibis, but that's not actually the deep reason. That's often the how did I justify to myself to do it? That's the how question, not the why question. 100%. And so what I will tell a wife session one is, my work with your husband is going to help him understand the real reason why. Because all of these problems existed in the marriage for you, and you didn't cheat. All the same problems have existed for other people, and they haven't cheated. So, you know, what is the hole, if you will, inside your husband that made this okay? But it doesn't matter what the reason. We'll, we'll work on this, and he will tell you, this is what I discovered with Dr. Caroline, and this is why. It's not going to be satisfying. There will never be a satisfying answer to why. Because no matter what he says, it'll be like, this isn't a good enough reason. And of course, there isn't a good enough reason. And so what I say to a woman is you have to look at him in the eye. Does he understand how he went down this path? Does he understand his triggers? Does it make sense to him how he fell? And then trust that he knows because the why is never going to be satisfying. I think there is something useful about the why because... If you do find out the why, so for example, it's childhood trauma, for example, say, you know, he saw his mother be incredibly hurt. And from that moment onwards, he did everything in his power to make women happy. And he's been doing everything in his power to make you happy. But actually, he's forgotten that he actually has needs as well. And it, he might not want to spend the weekend with your mother, for example. And if he could actually say that, rather than burying all of that stuff, you could have more honest conversations and there wouldn't be resentment building up. Now, of course, that doesn't justify the reason for having it. But if you want to stay a good marriage, then you need to solve some of the things that are contributing to the underlying issues. And if you don't know what the underlying issues are, you can't have a, a new, better marriage. So I do think the question why can be helpful, but it's not a magic answer for making you feel better. Oh, he did it for this reason. That's useful information, but it's not, it's not the magic answer to feel okay again. Right. It won't be satisfying. You won't hear it and say, oh, God, now I totally get why you cheated. Yes, information. And I think that also helps with building empathy. But the therapy has to, or coaching has to be in stages. The first one being stop the rolling car help her feel secure in the marriage. Then we can get into why was it that he couldn't communicate with you? Because that is where women can make things difficult for men. You know, we want you to communicate. And then when you do, we're like, not like that. That's not oh, what we wanted. And actually, I just want you to communicate nice things. Because, mm -hmm. you know, communicate with me, tell me stuff. But to be honest, I don't really want to know that somebody's upset that I've left my shoes in the hall yet again. Right. You know, I want the nice things. I'm not so keen on hearing about my mistakes. And, you know, that's natural, but we need to be able to learn to tolerate that stuff. Mm -hmm. Anyway, let's go back to this rolling truck. The truck is rolling. The car is rolling. Yeah, sorry. Well, both the car and the truck are often rolling, to be perfectly okay. honest. Yes. Um, and I'm in the car or the truck, and I want to feel better. I want to, I want to get past this. You know, I want to stop it. What are the most common mistakes that people make that will cause them problems further down the line? Let's concentrate on the women. What do the women do that makes everything worse for them? One is wanting to know too many details, especially X-rated details. Having the details of how someone cheated is so that they can recreate their own timeline. Because of course, cheating, she thought she was in one timeline and she was actually in a totally different one to recreate her own personal timeline. But all the details, they just haunt later on. Telling the children is terrible. We just discussed that. 
telling a bunch of other people to show how awful you've been treated and isn't your husband a jerk and all of this stuff. Well, then you do reconcile with your husband and then everyone knows you're the wife who stayed with the husband who cheated. Now you feel a little bit differently about it or people can't unring that bell, especially a woman's father, frankly. You know, in a traditional marriage, you know, you've given your little girl to a man. I know it's all like antiquated, not PC, but it's true. Your father has entrusted another man to take care of you and you've done something like this. Like, it's really hard for fathers to forgive their son-in-laws after this, even if they've been cheaters. Do you find that some women make their mind up too soon what they're going to do, that the truck is still rolling on top of them? They're crushed and they decide at that moment, I'm going to make this work rather than, you know, <laughs> let's get out of the car, let's find out how bad it is. But trying to make a decision too quickly, it makes you feel better for a short amount of time. You know, I'll get through this no matter what, but you're not actually quite certain what has happened. It's, oh, he does want to stay with me. I'm not going to be abandoned. Yay. Let's do some hysterical bonding, which is the crazy sex that sometimes happens after an affair is discovered. And let's just move to how I can be a better wife. Frankly, this is what men do a lot when they're cheated on. When mm. men are cheated on, they come into my office. Like I said, they don't really want to know the details, definitely not the X-rated details. They want to put it in a little box and they want to move forward. You still love me? Good. This wasn't about you not loving me. You want to stay. Then how could I be a better husband? And that makes it all about you. You were cheated on because you were not good enough. A woman or whoever it is who's been cheated on needs some time for some righteous anger and to not be okay and to have that marriage tested because fundamentally someone has cheated rolling the dice on their marriage. And so a fear is if I'm not a perfect wife, will you cheat again? Well, let's find out here in the beginning, be angry, but they don't because they don't want to push their husbands into the arms of their affair partner. And women aren't allowed to be angry in our society, are they? Oh. Men are allowed to be angry, but women have to be nice. Right, have to be nice. And I can't say this too often, it's okay to be angry. Yeah, and set some boundaries. But they're so afraid that, I mean, you just said, he's still, you know, calling the affair partner, how are you doing? I'm so concerned, type of thing. She's afraid if I'm angry, he's going to go to what's easy. Yes, but is it really easy? No, it is disastrous. It is disastrous. I'm sure you've found that, Andrew, how disastrous it is. I mean, how many clients have come in my office? They met cheating at work, both left their respective spouse, and now they're back in my office because guess what? He cheated again because of the magic, right? It's magic. It isn't that I made these poor decisions. It's like, oh, it, it, if I just change partners, everything will be okay. I just, I just needed to be with my soulmate. You know, one of the justifications what makes it okay to cheat. And often these couples have caused so much damage that they have to have the golden marriage, the ones who've started as an affair. And therefore, it's almost impossible to accept any of the rubbish in the relationship and look at it. And every relationship <laughs> is, is work, isn't it? Well, and how common is it that the first fight they have is, and I left my wife for you. And all this idea that oh, the kids will be resilient and the kids will accept the affair partner. No, the, the kids have been seeing mom crying in the corner and you being off in Hawaii, not paying child support because you're with the affair partner. No, the kids hate her. The kids aren't going to accept her. And, and, and men are just so confused, but don't they want me to be happy? No, they don't. Move on, cancel with the affair partner, date someone new, and magically you will see, magic, that your ex-wife and your kids always did want you to be happy, but not with the woman that destroyed their entire lives. And eventually they see it because it's also a certain type of person who will see a married man with children and say, and you, you're the one I'm going to pick as my soulmate. But it's also someone with some mm, not great boundaries. Yes. It's so sad that men don't talk to each other because I think if men were truthful to each other and just say how horrible their divorce was, I think their co-workers probably wouldn't go down that route. And, you know, once they've actually been there, they say, oh, this is horrible. Why didn't you tell me? And they said, well, 
It's just not in their vocabulary. Men don't talk to each other about these things. And if men did, they would realize just how complex it is and how difficult it is to actually get out of the long-term impact of infidelity. Well, how about a step before that? How about saying marriage is hard? Becoming parents, you know, I always say children are a blessing, dot, 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 but they don't tell you how much it affects your marriage. How about telling men like, hey, your wife's going to be not good, not meeting your needs, where you might have had this very attentive wife who was always making you breakfast and remembered the favorite sodas for the refrigerator and everything, and she's going to have other things going on. And this is how you can support her instead of getting angry at her and how you can love her through this and, and trust that your marriage will come back versus the things that men do that push women away and make women think, oh, gee, I have two children. I have my husband and I have this child and resentment builds, right? So it would be helpful if men could talk to other men about, wow, okay, this is going to change your marriage, how it's going to change your marriage, how men could, I don't know, support other men, which they're terrible at doing, and how to explain like the changes your wife was going to go through and how you can be there and have a marriage. That would help a lot. So the thing that I get over and over again, and I expect you will, is what do you do when you're stuck? He doesn't really want to work on the relationship, but he wants to stay. And it's sort of okay on a day-to-day -day basis, but you're slowly dying inside. How do you deal with that? They've got back on the road again, but the vehicle is so damaged, but it's still moving forward. What do you do under those conditions? Well, I think it depends. Couples will just get stuck or plateau or whatever. But initially, has the man taken responsibility? 100% for going outside the marriage was on him. Has he tried to help his wife heal to the best of his ability and not rushed her along in her healing process, not pressured her to get over it? Or is it just like, let's sweep this under the rug. I'll be angry at you, you know, every month and we know why, but then we'll sweep it under the rug. Because I don't think if a man isn't willing to do the work, then you should leave the marriage. I think that there are two schools. There are the, everyone who cheats as a narcissist, you need to leave. And then the schools of like, I stayed, you should stay. Christ wants you to stay, stay under all conditions. And I think I take more of a criteria-based approach which is, yeah, if he's willing to be remorseful and really do the work and take a look at why he did this and not blame you, well, then that's the relationship worth staying in. That's a relationship that is going to thrive after this. But otherwise, no, leave. I mean, I'm just, why? Life is short. You know, I, I tell all of my clients when they come to the office to meet with the divorce attorney, make sure you're staying because you want to stay and not because you feel financially forced to stay. When do you know it's time to leave? Well, when it's not time to leave is first off. And I think we also have to look at, do you have children, right? Because although your husband didn't think it through to the consequence of your children, you don't get a free pass to not think of the children. But I do think that most women initially, that's the reason they say that they're wanting to stay is that it's affecting everyone's life and they want to make sure it's a good decision, especially since he's probably been a good father. I think if you don't have children, you leave whatever you want. If you do have children, then you need to let the dust settle. You should not make any big major life decision when you're in an emotional roller coaster, which you are. You're an emotional roller coaster. I equate it to one of those souvenir snow globes that you shake up and you can't see what the picture is. It's like you need six months just for the dust to settle for you to see what's going on before making a decision. I think that if the man won't give up the affair partner, as Tracy Shorn of Chump Lady says, the pick me dance of who's better for me, I'm so torn, the affair partner, the wife type, of, you know, exit. I mean, the, the continuing to cheat, the continuing to have contact, you should leave. Like, don't do that to yourself. That's a living hell. So do you think there can be any light from the darkness of infidelity? Is there a positive side to infidelity? Well, this might be a terrible analogy, but it's like, say, cancer. Do people have cancer and then on the other side of it, find new meaning in their life and pursue things they wouldn't have pursued? Absolutely. But they didn't want to have cancer. 
right? So it's like, yes, from infidelity, from any bad thing, you can try to take something positive from it, but not like, hey, let's have infidelity so our marriage could get better. No, no, I wasn't suggesting that. No, but, um, because I've, I've said it and I haven't qualified it and I've gotten pushback that somehow I think infidelity is okay. So I want to, again, state, no, uh, it's not. But yes, how do relationships get better? Well, one is a lot of times the man hasn't expressed himself to his wife or the wife hasn't been listening. And now it's like, well, what could be worse than you cheating? Tell her everything. And she can say like, oh, I've been withholding this and that. Like this jerk husband's cheated. I'm going to say everything. All the things they've been holding back and misperceptions that they've had for years are finally like brought out. And there also is on a man's part, a lot of men maybe not a lot of men, the vast majority of men I see began to believe their wife didn't even like them. Yeah, I get that a lot too. Why might a man think his wife doesn't like him? Oh, how about constantly being shamed for having sexual needs? I think that women view a man wanting to have sex with his wife as orgasming. And so it's like, do it in the shower, don't make a mess, whatever. And not about how it's the one place in life I think that men are free to be emotional, are appreciated, are told like, wow, we're building something together. I'm going to go to this job I hate tomorrow and deal with a boss I hate, and deal with clients maybe I don't like, but it's all for my wife. It's all for my family. You know, here I have this woman that I've devoted my whole life to, and she thinks I'm amazing. You know, we had a fight, or I cried in front of her, or I told her I was stressed out at work, and more feminine feelings, and yet here we are making love. I'm still her man. You know, it's safe for me to have all emotions with this woman and still be masculine. So the constantly being rejected, shamed, let on, tested, having it be some sort of reward for doing something. You know, good men don't want that. It's a mutual exchange of desire, energy, chemistry. I think that women want sex that is a little bit more than, you know, I'll do this if you do that for me. Transactional. They want sex that is actually a bit deeper than that. But somehow both of them have lost their way in the old habits. And the another positive of infidelity is it can actually make you look with fresh eyes at your love life. Because often I find that people are having the same kind of sex they had when they first got together. You know, they no longer go to the same holiday destinations. They no longer eat in the same restaurants or wear the same clothes, but they're still having exactly the same sex. And actually, you're a different person 10, 15 years later, and your body's different and you like different things, but you haven't updated each other on this. And infidelity makes you look at sex again and explore who you are today and the sort of lovemaking you want to have now. So that's definitely another benefit to it. Well, I think a benefit is a woman looking at herself and remembering. Right. Tell me about that. Well, that sex used to be about making love. And somehow through having kids or whatever, making love to her husband became about self-care. So just like she's not taking a bubble bath, she's not doing anything for herself, also connecting with her husband isn't something she's doing. Sex then becomes something for him. And then it's another chore. It's another thing she has to do instead of something she's doing for herself. So that's another positive that can come out of infidelity, that you can actually begin to start thinking about self-care, looking after yourself. We sort of have a sense that our partner's got to look after us. And rather than outsourcing, let's go straight in there and do things that make us feel good. And I'm talking for both partners of this. Self-care is not being selfish, it's necessity. <laughs> Help me explain why self-care is so important. Well, I think they say if you don't fill yourself, you can't fill anyone else's cup, right? And then you're not truly giving of yourself. And when you're not doing that, you become resentful. And there are so many married women with kids out there that are just resentful all the time and brewing in anger and hating themselves because there's this gold standard somehow of a woman who works, but just enough is home with the kids, but not too much. It's like a, mothers are never winning. And then they turn and they blame their husband for it somehow. And that's not going to be the recipe for a happy marriage, is it? Self-care is so important. I know. It's something, Andrew, honestly, I, I struggle with myself. Do you? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that all therapists maybe struggle with it. You know, at least I'm honest, though, with my clients. And I'll say, I'm giving you advice that I don't take. <laughs> 
I'm honest. I'm like, you really need to have someone watch the kids and go for a walk around the block and get some sunshine. But I'm, I'm honest. I tell them I'm not doing it either. So, Well, perhaps it's because I'm a man. <laughs> <laughs> I have a supervisor. I have my own therapist. I belong to a heart circle of men. I have a dog that I take out and walk. Mm -hmm. You know, it is terribly important that I look after myself because how can I look after other people if I don't look after myself? But then as a woman, I would say, and so who's picking up all the pizzas? Who's watching kids? Who's doing the laundry? Who's thinking about what you're having for dinner and, and making sure you've gone grocery shopping? I'm not blaming you, Andrew. I'm just saying like, that's how it begins. And I think instead of women looking to men and being resentful, right, is say to a man, I would like that for myself. How can we make that happen? Happen. And I think an honest conversation, most husbands are like, okay, all they want, happy wife, happy life. Tell me what you need to be happy, but tell me, don't yell at me, don't nag me, don't treat me like a child, don't resent me. Just lay it all out what you want. Oh, if we're putting our cards on the table, get the children to do more. Stop treating the children like gods and goddesses because your sons are old enough to get their own blooming pizza. Mm -hmm. Well, my children are, but, you know. Yeah, yeah. I'm talking about, yeah. you know, there are two other people in the household who can also pull their weight too. Oh, I, Andrew, I'm looking over my computer at one of my kids' job charts. <laughs> What's on his job chart? Well, he's nine and he has autism. So there's a lot of just like basic things he has to do, but emptying the trash is a big one. He's big enough now. He's strong enough. He gets to empty the trash. And my older son is now putting the dishes away. We're tall in the Madden family. So when we redid the kitchen, it was made for people who were about six foot tall. So that was a problem with then having the kids put the dishes away. But I spied him. He's five foot one now. He's tall enough. So we started that this week. Like, oh, look at you. You grew. And you got all these new adult things because you're a big yes. boy now. Yes. 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 And here you go. So do you think infidelity can be the pathway to the meaningful life? Because rather than just being so busy worrying about the trash and the dishes, you start living the examined life. And the examined life is the first step to the meaningful life. What do you think? Well, I think when, especially when women have been in relationships for years, if not decades, and they've put their husband on a pedestal and have counted on him. And so I think when that falls and he's a human being who is flawed and capable of doing things he never thought he was capable of, it's a reflection of like, what are my resources? How am I going to get through? This is where when people have a relationship with God, that helps them enormously get through and really examine that relationship that they also took that for granted, right? Because they picked the perfect life. Of course, everything is going to work out. Life is just more complicated. So I've always said that women who go through infidelity are some of the strongest women I've ever met. The amount of strength to not take responsibility for someone else's bad behavior and contain yourself and your boundaries and get through, especially the mama bears out there going through something like this, but having to not wig out in front of the kids, like that takes so much strength. And if I had one piece of advice, I think is if you're stuck, go deeper and go down another layer, because often down another layer, you find all sorts of important things like, you know, why am I putting up with all this rubbish? Well, actually, I saw my mother put up with a whole load of rubbish as well. And I was given these lessons. And actually, you might need to have a slightly different relationship with your mother, for example. There's all sorts of material that you find when you dig down a little bit deeper. And some of the pain is about the infidelity. And some of the pain might be unresolved material from the past that you were just sort of asphalting over with a happy marriage. Sometimes it's helpful to look at what's underneath the asphalt so that looking deeper can be a way of dealing with being stuck. Yeah, well, and sometimes women get stuck because they did see their mom go through infidelity and they saw their mother, for example, stay, but never resolve it and be bitter and wounded and hurt or the father eventually left anyhow. And so they don't want to be that person. I'm like, you have to look at yourself and you have to look at your husband 
and what's going on with the two of you and not... But I think you also need to make peace with your mother as well, because you're probably angry with your mother in some kind of way. And, you know, it might be time to actually look at that anger and for the two of you to have the difficult conversations you and your mother have actually ducked. Well, and I think that that does happen when a woman tells her mother and you know, I don't want to get into direct client information, but often it's been amazing advice. You're looking at, I should have left and I should have done this, but you didn't look at what I benefited by staying, the memories I did have, the happiness I did have by staying. You know, like it allows them to also see the complete picture of their mom as a human being and also living in a different generation with different resources and support and whatever, and have a conversation about, well, you're an adult, I'm an adult, what really happened there? What do you wish you had done differently? What are you happy while you stayed? So those conversations do happen and they're very, you talk about meaningful, they're, they're deeply meaningful to both parties. So we're going to, in a moment, look at a letter but let me remind you how you can be somebody who would write a letter to me and my guests. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Please follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material and other benefits. One of the great advantages of being a member of our supporters club is you get all sorts of added benefits. You'll get a chance to hear all of my conversation with Caroline because we'll be finding out the three things that she knows to be true. And that's just for people in our supporters club. There's also a chance to join our Ask Me Anything group. That happens not in public and to write in a letter. And I think, Caroline, you're going to find this letter rather familiar, but here goes. My husband had an affair and I was totally blindsided. Our marriage was one friends and family looked up to. Now I feel as though our marriage and love was just a lie. All that wasted energy. Years, 25 years, right out of college, just wasted. My husband was devastated at the thought of losing me. He loves me more than anything and always has and I wasn't in my right mind. The insanity plea. Is it a valid defence? Funnily enough, it took him three months after my initial discovery and discovering the emotional affair was still going on for his catharsis. I've decided to stay, but I'm afraid I will never feel the same love I once did. So, Caroline, what would you say to my correspondent? Well, one is, I'm so sorry. Mm. You know, I am so sorry you were going through this. And that there are stages. And definitely when you're in the beginning, you don't believe there are stages and you feel like you're going to be in this type of rolling of the car, not knowing the future, anger, sadness. You believe you're going to be there forever. And you won't be in this stage feeling this way forever. Hard to believe, but true. What I would also say is that men, when they cheat, compartmentalize and men are prepared for their wife's anger. Oh, well, my wife, she found out she'd be angry, but she's never going to find out, right? Which is the top guy. They tell themselves they're never going to find out. But even if she should find out, she's just going to be angry. What they aren't prepared for is exactly what this wife is saying. He is not prepared for his wife of over two decades to look him in the eye and not know him anymore. Here, he for 25 years has gotten up, provided for the family, I'm assuming, gone to work, helped raise the kids, helped maybe his wife and her professional endeavors too, was a good son-in-law, did everything for so many years. And then he does this one thing and all of that gets erased. That's what he's not prepared for. He's not prepared for her looking at him as a stranger and not in a good way. So that's also why it's important that Wives feel free to tell their husbands, not just of the anger, but of this, of just the disappointment and the, and the hurt. So, I mean, blindsided. Yep, that's why I called my book Blindsided by His Betrayal. Right there. Yep. There we go. Bam. And just this, you know, how many wives come into my office? All of them say, if anyone knew we were here, not only would they be shocked, they'd be devastated. So why is it the marriages that everybody looks up to? I don't know, because they're good guys. I mean, there are plenty of good guys that people look up to that aren't cheating too, but... I, I think it's because getting people to look up to you comes at a cost. Oh, right. I see what you're saying. 
Yeah. That sometimes you're doing the right thing or what everybody in society believes is the right thing, but it actually might not be right for you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, actually what other people think of your marriage, to be perfectly honest, doesn't matter. It's what the two of you think. And if you're playing to the gallery, that might be a problem. Just like we're talking about wives having a whole list of chores. I think men do too when it becomes, he's the good guy. Mm. He's the good guy who'll help you move. He's the good guy that will teach your kid how to ride a bike. I mean, I'm just thinking of things that have been told to me, you know, that he's, he's there for everyone except maybe himself. And that's what the affair represents. There's something for him. And perhaps she's been there for everybody else, or she's been busy trying to look like the perfect Mm mum, you know, baking the cookies and putting photographs of them on Facebook, that there's been so much performance. And actually, the meaningful life, which is actually leading the life you want to lead. And, you know, if the life you want to leave is buying the blooming cookies, for goodness sake, do it. Mm-hmm. And I've been terribly simple, but actually deep down that we are often too busy performing and doing things that we think is going to impress people mm-hmm. rather than actually what is right for us. And the other thing I would say to her is, I'm pleased that she's not going to feel the same love she once did, because what we want is a new relationship and a new real kind of love. So sometimes the love beforehand is pedestal love. Mm -hmm. And actually, that's not real love. Real love is accepting people warts and all. And this is for him accepting you warts and all and not actually putting you on a pedestal too, because I can tell you men put women on pedestals and it's rather difficult to have good sex with somebody who's on a pedestal Mm -hmm. because, you know, you think they're going to be shocked by your desires. We want you both off the pedestal. We want it based on real love. We want it based on a new relationship rather than what you had 25 years ago. Because even in great marriages, it's not the same as 25 years ago. It's probably a different kind of love. It's a more rounded kind of love. It's a more real love. At the beginning, it's based on the promise of how things are going to be. You know, you think we're going to have children. We're going to do this. We're going to do all these things. So it's based on the future. Now, the relationship is going to be based on something actually more solid of who we are rather than our expectations and our fantasies Mm. of each other. Well, the idea of it being more honest, and of course, you can have a more honest marriage without infidelity. But this is where these people are now. Yeah, I just want to put that out there. I, I think something, though, that is true is knowing that someone you loved and you trusted so much could do this to you does change you. But it changes you and affects you whether you stay or whether you go. People are like, oh, well, if I leave, if I divorce them, I will. you're still going to have that knowledge. You're still going to have that knowledge. You can't unring that bell. It does change you. So it also changes you. And what you learn is you're okay. Yeah. You're okay if you're with him, especially like women who are worried that their husbands are going to cheat. It's like, oh, guess what? The worst happened to you. And guess what? You're okay. You didn't die. You're actually fine. You're living. You didn't have a complete breakdown. That you're going to be okay no matter what. You're going to be okay if you stay, if you go. You're also going to be okay if he cheats on you, but you need, again, but you need a plan for that. And you're going to discover a huge amount about yourself. Some of it you're not going to like, but a lot of it's going to be wonderful. You're going to do new things. And my gosh, you're going to learn a lot about yourself and about, you're going to be listening to podcasts like this. Mm -hmm. And you've learned a huge amount, hopefully by listening to Caroline and myself and all the other people, we've got some we've got some wisdom. And the strength, again, I, I, I go back to the strength that I think women thought they were strong and then they go through something like this. Their strength, their belief in themselves, their faith in God, all of it is so tested at this time. And I mean, that's one of the beautiful things about my work is seeing women discover their true self too. You're my witness on The Meaningful Life. So I have to ask you, what makes your life meaningful? Well, I'm going to go with the cliche, but true. You know, my family brings me great meaning and that they ground me. But my work with adults, kind of with the infidelity, but not directly with infidelity, is helping my clients, my adult clients, realize that the bad things that happened to them as children weren't their fault at all. And logically, they know that, but they don't spiritually and emotionally really support that younger person who was violated. And so I think that's the most meaningful 
thing I do as a therapist is help people forgive what never needed to be forgiven in the first place and how their life, their parenting, their everything is transformed through truly embracing themselves and feeling the strength and being a safe adult. Uh, so that's the most meaningful part. Obviously, that's that's hard work. And there are some therapists who specialize in only that. But that was too difficult for me, honestly, emotionally to do, especially having young children myself. But that's very meaningful to me as a human being. I can see how helping other people to forgive themselves would make your life meaningful. And I think is the beginning of helping them to have a more meaningful life as well. So thank you for sharing your experiences today. In a moment, Caroline and I are going to reflect on this because I think it's really interesting having a male therapist and a female therapist talking about infidelity because it's a topic that can divide the sexes very easily. So we're going to reflect on this if you want to hear this conversation and three things that Caroline knows to be true, then there's some details coming about how to join our supporters circle. So Caroline, thank you very much for now for being my guest today. Oh, thank you. Absolutely a pleasure, Andrew. And thank you for having me on. You've been listening to The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. You can follow Andrew on Twitter, like him on Facebook, and please leave a review wherever you consume your podcasts. Making, editing, and distributing The Meaningful Life comes with substantial costs, and we'd like to ask for your help. Visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material for every program, send in a letter to be discussed by Andrew and his guests, and join a community of other people seeking to make their life meaningful. At the gold level, you get even more benefits. Production of The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall is by Michael Dooney. Social media by Madeleine Healy. Sound engineering and theme tune by Sebastian de la Luz Mendoza. And I'm Susie Colick. Please tell your friends and spread the word. Thank you.